I'm Chance. I'm Sarah Catherine. And welcome to Season 2 of Conservation Connection. Presented by Last Chance Endeavors. We're a husband and wife team running a wildlife education nonprofit that's focused on connecting students to their environment. Each week here on Conservation Connection, we do just that by introducing you to the groundbreaking science and conservation work that's happening every day across the globe. We talk to professionals in the world of conservation science and wildlife management and ask them about their careers, their current projects, their wild and crazy stories from the field, and everything in between. This episode is a collaboration with Sitka Whale Fest and the Sitka Sound Science Center. Sitka Whale Fest is a celebration of whales and marine science that happens every November in Sitka, Alaska. It aims to communicate marine science to the ocean-loving public. Listen in to hear the stories of leading researchers and educators in the Pacific Ocean ecosystem as they share the science and the passion that brought them to Sitka. Our trip to Sitka was funded in part by Midnight Science Club. Let's get to the show. Alrighty guys, welcome to another episode of Conservation Connection. We're really excited. We're here in Sitka looking at the beautiful Sitka Sound. Um, we're sitting across the table from Keisha Barr and Danny Coffey. Keisha is an assistant professor with Texas A&M Corpus Christi, and Danny is a postdoctoral researcher assistant at Texas A&M Corpus Christi. Welcome to the show. Thank you for Thank having you us. Thank you for having us. We're super excited to have you guys on, especially because you are a husband and wife team, just like the two of us. So uh, I think you're the first husband and wife team that we've had on the show. Let's get into a little bit of the science before we go into the background here. I know that you guys work on two different things. So Keisha, can you give me just like a two sentence snapshot of what your field of study is? Yes. Uh, so a lot of my work focuses on how corals are being impacted by what we're doing here on land and how humans are really shaping our reefs. So right now we're trying to get a better idea of how can we mitigate these impacts that we've had on our reefs and help them be more resilient for those future impacts we're expected to see with corals and coral reefs. So some of the work that I've been working on is coral bleaching, which is happening all across the world right now and helping facilitate those corals to recover from this bleaching that's happening. At the same time, we're trying to reduce some of these local impacts that we have uh, as well on our reefs and then also get a better idea of how can we make reefs more resilient in the future. Awesome. And Danny, how about you? So I use a variety of different types of tagging technologies to track the movement and behavior of a variety of sharks and fishes. And with this information, we can get a window into the uh, behavior of these animals and the habitat use. And then I try to see how the environment is driving that behavior, such as uh, do they change their behavior under cold temperatures versus warm? And that can vary uh, horizontally, like if they're migrating north and south, or it can also happen vertically if they're just moving deeper in the water column. Yeah, it's interesting because on land, when you're managing the wildlife, they only move in two dimensions. You know, they're going forward and back or left and right. And they're not really, you know, climbing much higher. Um, but when you're managing oceanic species, we're talking a lot about depth as well. And that adds a, a fun new dimension to it. Yeah, exactly. So you guys just recently made the move to Texas. Congratulations. Yeah. It's a great state. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Love my home state. <laughs> With the research that you're doing, what what is it that took you there? So my research for the past 10 years has been focused in Hawaii and helping the people there, the state, the local communities better manage their resources that are so close to their shores. And moving to Texas was a little bit further, but what I've noticed being already in Texas is that there is a large interest in helping preserve the reefs that are in the Gulf of Mexico. Because when we look at the Gulf of Mexico, that is essentially a watershed of everything that happens in pretty much 90% of the United States goes into the Gulf of Mexico. And there are coral reefs there. And we need to raise awareness of what impacts we're having in those reefs and get a better idea of how can we make changes here on land and help prevent the changes that are happening in the ocean. So it's almost as much about human behavior as it is about coral biology, right? Mm -hmm. It's more about what we do has an impact underwater. Right. And and I am a biologist. I am a coral nerd. I'm a coral biologist. And a lot of the issues that we are trying to face is, can we understand what's happening with the corals and how they are being impacted and what changes are happening with the corals and the reefs? And how can we relay that information to humans so we can help make changes here on land? 
Um, unfortunately, my background is not in human biology or behavior, but we're hoping to start pulling people together to make these changes. And on my side, I'm trying to make science-driven solutions to help facilitate those changes. Absolutely. It's a collaborative effort. No mm -hmm. one person is going to do everything from collecting the data to crunching it to communicating it and writing the laws that mm -hmm. affect people. So being a part of that solution is a, a really, really important thing. What got you interested in corals? Like what was the turning point where you're like, this is what I want to study? Well, I grew up in a very small farm town in Ohio. And at that time, I you know, was in high school and I just didn't really know what I was going to do with my life or where I was going to go. And then um, there was an opportunity to take a marine biology class in the next town over. And I took that class. And a part of that class, you got to go to Florida for a week. And I was like, this is awesome. I want to go to Florida. It's really cold in Ohio. I want to go where, somewhere where it's warm. And when I did take that class, I got my first experience with the ocean and being able to snorkel on a coral reef. And I was just fascinated about all the colors there were, all the noises that I heard, and these underwater cities that were there, and I had no idea being so far from the ocean. So after I, I finished that course, I just went back to my family and I was like, okay, I'm gonna move to Florida, and I'm gonna go study marine biology, and I hope everything works out. And they're like, okay, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> um, so then I, I did leave. I was the first person in my um, family that went to college that left my small town. And I uh, just kept moving further and further away from, I went to undergrad in Florida. And then I switched and went to Hawaii to finish my undergrad. And then I stayed there for the next 10 years to finish my training. And my family's like, please come closer back to Ohio. <laughs> They didn't want to fly out to Hawaii to visit? They did. I mean, they did come and visit a lot. but um, It's a little pricey. It's a little pricey. Yeah. And the time, you know, to get out there, it's, it's a long flight. Um, but they were supportive. They understood that I was trying to do really big things um, and that I would make a, hopefully make a difference sometime and come back and every now and then and see them. So yeah. um, I think that was like my main motivations when I first experienced it and saw the coral reefs. It was... It was just astonishing. And then when I learned more and more throughout my training that there was a decline and that these were disappearing and not everyone in the world has seen coral reefs. I just decided at that point, I, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to make a difference and try to stop the, the rate of decline that we're seeing. And Danny, what about your experience? Were you always like, I love sharks. I want to work with sharks. Um, honestly, yes. <laughs> um, I've always wanted, been infatuated with sharks since I was a young boy. I didn't actually know how to turn that into a career, though, until much later in life, even after getting my bachelor's degree in marine biology. Um, I didn't know about tagging technologies and how researchers could study sharks by, you know, putting satellite tags on them to see where they go and both in the three-dimensional ocean environment, as we discussed. Um, and something that was really interesting was I actually during my bachelor's, read a book called The Devil's Teeth by Susan Casey, and it refers to these, the Farallon Islands, which are located just uh, west of San Francisco. And there's a bunch of bird researchers out there that started to notice certain times of the year that all of these great white sharks would arrive and would be hunting on the seals there. So then they got in touch with some shark researchers to go out there and, and try and tag these sharks and then realized um, that they actually swim all the way out to Hawaii. And I ended up later getting in touch with those very same shark researchers and then was able to do my master's thesis with them um, and then continued to work with them at Monterey Bay. That's really cool. And for my master's, I actually got to look at a, a cousin, so to speak, of the great white shark known as the salmon shark, which lives up here in Alaska as well, but also undergoes these really long migrations um, and have been known to even frequent Hawaii as well. That's so cool. I want to go a little bit further. We're going to take a little tangent here. You said they were a cousin of the great white shark. So I know mm -hmm. that great white sharks are pretty physiologically different from a lot of other shark species. In what ways are salmon sharks related or similar? So yeah, they have a very similar physiology to white sharks, uh, as well as mako sharks. And so what kind of sets them apart from all other species of sharks is that they are able to elevate their body temperature um, above what it is in the water. So most fish and most shark usually their body temperature will be the exact same temperature as what the water that they're swimming in. But these sharks are very special in that they're able to circulate their blood in a way that it stays, part of the blood stays closer to where their muscles are working really hard. And so just like you, if you're working out, you know, you're starting to elevate your body temperature, um, they can retain that heat 
And so that allows them to, for example, for the salmon shark to stay in really cold water in Alaska that uh, other sharks usually wouldn't be able to survive in. It seems like opening up opportunities for them to feed in areas that other sharks are unable to, that seems like a pretty great competitive edge. Yeah. And going back to the three dimensionality of the ocean. Um, so yeah, it allows them to be at higher latitudes, such as here in Alaska, but it also allows them to go deeper into waters that and uh, other species might not be able to get because it's too cold. And then usually when you go deeper in the ocean, things start to like life starts to slow down a bit because it's really cold. So everyone just kind of chills out. Um, but if you go down there and have and are warmer than everything else around you, then you're able to move faster and hunt easier. So that also gives you a, an advantage. It's like you have super speed when everything yeah. else is slow. <laughs> exactly. Easy pickings. <laughs> With your research that you do, are you often in a boat or are you in the water more? Or is it kind of a mix of both? Um, usually it's from the boat, fishing for these sharks and then bringing them up and working with them and then um, attaching different devices and releasing them so they can go about doing their thing. Um, there is some diving involved, which is nice. I get to be out on the water, both uh, on the surface and underwater. Um, usually that involves deploying these little listening devices that are stationed around. So for example, when we were in Hawaii, we had these listening devices spread uh, around all of the islands. And whenever one of our tag sharks swims uh, next to them, it'll record their ID number and say, oh, shark 5571 was here at this date and time. And then you get some really cool data from that. So it's acoustic tags yes. is what you're talking about there? Exactly. That's awesome. I think, is it was it Gorka, Gorka. Sancho? Mm -hmm. One of our very first episodes, actually, I think episode one was a guy who was doing acoustic tagging on sharks in Charleston estuaries. And they were very surprised to find like 16 foot sharks really commonly swimming around in, in the Charleston waters there. But yeah, so I, I think acoustic tags are really interesting technology because it's a lot of times with tagging, you're trying to have sort of this continuous transfer of information from the tag to, you know, it's trying to relay that information in real time. And acoustic tags are much more, they're not quite passive, but they're more passive than say like a GPS tag, where it's just the animal has to swim by your listening device. And that's how you know that it's there. Exactly. And that technology is actually very popular um, in the Pacific Northwest, particularly for species like salmon, because they can put one of these receivers or listening devices at the mouth of a stream that these salmon might pass through so then they know when they're coming through there nice to have like a specific channel like everybody's going to walk through yeah. the doorway <laughs> so let's put it here yeah it's very you have to strategically place them yeah so with keisha working on coral and danny you working with sharks do you guys ever get to collaborate or are you pretty much just in two separate labs like always so what's really interesting is we have collaborated on one project, but it had nothing to do with corals or sharks. It was actually on green sea turtles. Okay. Oh, wow. So we thought, you know, you have the corals at the bottom, the sharks at the top. Can we meet somewhere in the middle <laughs> <laughs> and work together on a project? And it was actually really fun. We were documenting sea turtles around Hawaii, uh, mostly around the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. And what we noticed is that these sea turtles were starting to come in and aggressively feed on this invasive algae. And we're like, this is great. This invasive algae is overgrowing and smothering the corals. And then you have this large herbivore coming in and actually taking that away. And at the time, they have been documented to eat this algae, but they were very aggressive about how they were going about obtaining it. And for example, at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, they do have a shark pen or sharks in not really captivity, but there is an area uh, where there there are sharks and it is closed off. And the turtles are actually trying to climb into the shark pen because there was algae inside of there. Wow. wow. Yeah, it was, it was a very That's interesting, nuts. it was an interesting um, thing that was happening. And some of the, our colleagues have been there for at least 30 years and they've seen the same algae around these areas on top of the corals. And there's been a lot of efforts by people around the state of Hawaii to try to remove this algae that was introduced there. And what we found out is just bring in the turtles and they'll clean it up for us. That's so cool. So Keisha, you actually were invited here to Wellfest to give a presentation that we saw yesterday and it was wonderful. Um, so we want to kind of recap a little bit for our listeners, a little bit of what you were talking about in your presentation. And I know it, it focused a lot on coral bleaching. So can you kind of give us a little bit of background on what that phenomenon is and what's causing it? Yeah. So 
The interesting thing about working with corals is they're not very simple creatures. And I've had a lot of questions asking, is a coral an animal? Is it a plant? Is it a rock? What exactly is it? And my answer is always, it's all of those things. Because a coral is an animal, but it does have um, algae inside of it. Um, common name for the algae that live inside of it is zooxanthellae. And that coral animal and the zooxanthellae, the microscopic algae inside, do have this symbiotic relationship where they're both benefiting from each other's uh, presence there. And also at the same time, the algae is producing energy for the coral from photosynthesizing the energy from the sun. And then the coral in turn gives the algae somewhere to live. But all of that energy that the algae is producing is actually allowing the coral to continue to live and also grow the skeleton. So that is the rock part of it. So it's, it's all three. It's all three. Yeah. yeah, it's a very fun organism to work with because it's just so complicated. But what, what is happening right now is since corals and their algae have such a unique symbiotic relationship, if there's any change in the environment, we do see that relationship does break down. And when that breaks down, we don't really know if the algae leave or the coral kick them out or what's happening, but the, the algae are no longer as present in the coral as more healthy times. And that breakdown in that relationship leaves the coral looking bleach because the coral tissue is actually transparent and the algae give the coral the color. So if you don't have as much algae, then the coral appears white because you're seeing the skeleton underneath. And how long have you been doing this research for? So I've been working with corals and coral bleaching for the past 10 years. But when I first started working with corals, I was conducting lab experiments where I would try to get the corals to bleach because I wanted to see like how much temperature, how much warming, if it happens, what at what point do they bleach? And also I was doing work with ocean acidification to really see the interaction of warming and acidification so, since those are two big problems that we're facing right now in our marine ecosystems. Can you, can you give a little background both on what acidification is and what's causing it and same for ocean warming? Yes, of course. So here on land, as we're burning our fossil fuels and greenhouse gases, we're creating a warming effect around our planet. And with that warming, we do see that most of that energy is going into our oceans. So it is increasing the temperature of our oceans. But at the same time, as we emit CO2 or carbon dioxide, that is dissolving into the oceans as well. And when it's, it dissolves into the oceans, it's lowering the pH of the ocean. With the lowering of the pH, that does create the ocean to be more acidic. And that becomes problematic for calcifying organisms such as corals, clams, oysters, and lobsters. The, the list goes on and on. So with this decrease in acidification and also with this increase in warming, they're happening at the same time. So we're really trying to understand if we have warming happening, we have acidification happening, how are organisms such as corals that calcify and that live in this small temperature window, how are they impacted based on these effects that we're doing here on land? And this is a really important question because even though corals represent 1% or less of the ocean's you know, surface or area, I, I should say, uh, there's a massive amount of biomass and species that depend on corals, right? Yes. And also, not only the species that depend on corals, we depend on corals. And about 500 million people rely on corals and the fish that are associated with the corals, they do rely on that for their livelihoods. So we're talking like fishermen, we're talking about recreational operators, scuba divers and stuff like that, that their whole world is based on the fact that there's coral out there, there's fish living with the coral, and they're able to make their living and feed their families because it's present. Exactly. And along with providing livelihoods and supporting all these species, corals also provide natural protection for people that live on islands. They break up the waves, the energy from the ocean, and it provides a barrier for people on land. So they, they serve so many different roles and also provide really epic uh, surf breaks if you're a surfer. <laughs> um, and I think if we do lose them, if we see these environmental changes happening, we see this breakdown between the algae and the coral, we're going to see a decline in our reefs. And it's already happening. It's been happening since the 1990s, if not earlier. And it, it's really alarming how fast this is happening. It's a really hard story, and, and it's not a local phenomenon. It happens all across the ocean's reefs. But I was really impressed yesterday. You talked a little bit about how the corals are responding to this change. Like That's really at the core of your research is how does coral respond to these environmental changes? And your presentation yesterday is the first time that I saw evidence that this may be almost a selection event where you're having some corals that are becoming more resilient. Can you talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with the bleaching events, it, it is 
pretty terrifying to witness one. And my first time I witnessed one was in 2014 and then again in 2015. And these are really devastating events where we see this response, this breakup between the algae and the coral happening on a large scale across entire reefs. But during these events, what we have noticed is that there is a difference response between different individuals of coral. So even though these bleaching events are happening, there's been some really great science that's come out of it because we see one individual that does bleach right next to an individual that doesn't bleach. And that is really interesting because we don't really know why one is bleaching and the other one isn't, but they're both exposed to the same environment. And this has been the core research for a lot of people working around the world trying to answer this question because that one that did not bleach might hold the answers that we need in order to make the corals more resilient or help them be more resilient to these ongoing bleaching events. And along with that, we've seen the differences between the individuals right next to each other. We've also seen that there may be a possibility that these corals are able to keep up with the warming that has occurred already over the past 50 years. So the environment is, uh, I mean, it has already dramatically shifted. We have warmer oceans today than we did 30 years ago. And you're seeing that there are some individual corals, not even like this species is more resilient than the other. It's two individuals of the same species that are side by side experience the same condition and one of those individuals is able to withstand it and not undergo bleaching while the other one does. And we really don't know why, right? That's a really important question so that we might be able to have corals persist with the way that the environment has already changed. Now the environment's not going to stop changing. So what are what's the thoughts on will these resilient corals be able to stay resilient if we keep changing at the rate that we've already changed? Yeah, that that's the alarming thing is even though we have seen corals bleach and some don't bleach during these bleaching events, and we've done some work where we have looked at corals, um, the same corals from this area in Hawaii, we looked at how they have changed over the past 50 years. So some of the earliest work was done in the 1970s where we defined how much temperature, how much warming does it require to bleach corals. And when we repeated those experiments, we saw that that capacity for those corals to not bleach has actually increased over the past 50 years. And there is, like you mentioned, there's already been warming that's happening, but the rate of warming that we're expected to see by 2050 is a lot more than what we've already seen right now. So we, we have shown that corals can keep up with this warming, but we're very nervous about how much more can they handle. And if you have back-to-back bleaching events, we had one in 2014, 2015, and then this year in 2019, it's just getting too much for the corals to handle. It's a lot of pressures. It's a lot of pressures. And right now, there's some estimates that we're expected to see a bleaching event every six years. And we've it's already been four years now, and we've already seen another bleaching event. So it's, it's occurring more frequent. It's getting worse every year. And it's just it's too much pressure for the corals to keep up with. And during your talk yesterday, I remember you mentioning that the professor you were working with was like, people aren't listening to what we're saying. And you said that we just have to find a better way to communicate with them. What ways have y'all found to work that to communicate with people to actually make them listen and to want to change? So I think that's the biggest struggle for us as scientists is trying to find ways to communicate this dense information that we have and break it up so we have a different way to communicate with different audiences. And that's why I've been pushing a lot Chasing Coral because they do just that. This is a, it's a beautiful film showing this coral bleaching event. And if you can actually see these changes happening over time, over a short period of time, it's the best way to actually ignite people and you know get them really excited and really try to make a difference. Because I can show figures of coral decline and these, you know, these graphs just showing like they're just going down and down and down. But when you show people actual visuals of corals bleached and then not recovering, they're actually, they're dead and how that's happening across larger scales. I think that's really powerful. So I think visuals have been very powerful, but also there's a big movement right now. Instead of talking about all these negative things and you kind of feel hopeless, like everything's dying, there's nothing we can do about it. Um, we've tried to change the message to make it a little bit more optimistic. Yes, we are seeing these changes. Yes, we're seeing decline, but we are seeing that some individuals of some species are able to withstand it. If we just slow down and slow this rate of warming, maybe the coral, the corals and other animals can keep up with them on a warming and we can really make a difference. And kind of the same question that I asked Danny earlier I think a lot of times you see people working with coral and you're like, oh, wow, you must be in the water just like constantly. What's the amount of lab work to in water work that you do? Because I know you do a lot of both. Yeah, 
I I wish I was in the water more. Don't we all? Yeah, <laughs> because it is it's something that I really try to instill with my students is that you need to be there and you need to observe in order to try to answer these questions that you have. And if you're not in the water, if you're not with these different animals that you're trying to study, then you really don't know what the environment is like that they're they're experiencing. Um, so I'm in the water sometimes and actually the more I the more research I do that I do more mentoring which I, I'm really happy to be involved and help train the next generation of students so I have them in the water more than myself and most of the time I'm behind the computer now writing this information up trying to communicate and try to find more funding to help facilitate this research and now um, in my new position I will be teaching as well so I'm actually going to be teaching a science communication class for graduate students at a and Corpus Christi. That's fantastic. That represents a really big shift in the culture of science because science communication was not taught for a very long time. And then people are realizing, oh, well, science is great, but if you can't tell people about it and have them understand it or care, it's not very helpful. That's amazing that you're teaching a science communication course. Yeah. And I, I completely agree. And I I think when my advisor during my time, he was very strict that scientists should do research and that's it. And then you have other people come in and take that research and translate it. And it's becoming a point now where we've noticed that even though we document this and we publish this information, it's not getting out there and that information is not being shared in a way that is fast enough. So this has been really a personal movement for myself to really get out there and try to communicate what we're seeing, what we can do about it, and how other people can get involved. And the fact that the universities are starting to see that this is really important, that our students are trained in science communication is really, really fascinating. It's really motivating for science, I believe, that it's really going to make a difference. Absolutely. And just kind of to wrap up, I'm sure you've been in the water tons with the work that you do. Do you have a favorite story from either your time together or separately during the research you've done of like just something crazy you've seen or that's happened that you just remember that you always tell the story of? I think uh, one of the experiences that we were both very fortunate to share together was our time in Hawaii. We were able to go aboard a NOAA research cruise to the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, which is the part of the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. And these are just a, a series of low-lying coral atolls that don't have any people that live on them. So they're very different from the main Hawaiian Islands, such as Oahu and Maui, that everyone goes to. And so up there, it's kind of going back in time to what the main Hawaiian Islands might have used to look like, where you go in the water and there's coral and sharks and large fish and just every turtles everything you can imagine just totally full of life like an episode of national geographic and we got to go together which was very rare to have a couple be part and we kind of had to sort of kept it on the down low but sure. <laughs> <laughs> um but she was my diving partner and we went up there mainly because i had the the an array of those underwater receivers i talked about earlier up there to monitor for tracking sharks and that was just a, a very special experience. And it's one of those things that, as Keisha said, you have to be there to see these things with your own eyes. And it reminds you why you're doing this in the first place, um, because sometimes you can get spend too much time behind the computer and not enough in the field. And one kind of sad part about that, though, is like I said, we're in a really isolated part of the planet. There's no people up there, but we are. I also witnessed very bad coral bleaching up there and it just kind of speaks to the the fact that these changes are happening globally and they're affecting areas um, where people don't even exist so people can have an impact even when they're not present that's yeah. an awesome story yeah i can't even imagine that's incredible i actually have one last question before we go so keisha you told us your favorite coral yes and i i think i might have a sense of your favorite shark danny but i would like to hear danny your favorite coral and Keisha, your favorite shark. Oh, Ooh, that's good. <laughs> Do you want me to go first? Okay. <laughs> oh, you know, I think my favorite shark, because I haven't really thought about it that much because they're all pretty cool, but I would definitely go with the hammerhead. Yeah, uh, because it's just, it's a very interesting shark. Actually, where Danny and I 
worked in Hawaii. It was a nursery for hammerheads. So there was these little tiny sharks all over the place. They're really cute. There were little pups, just a couple days to weeks old. And Danny and I would go out on the boat and I would help him um, try to fish for these sharks so then we can, you know, do some more studies with them or him do studies with them. And they're really cute. And I always joked about trying to bring one back and put it in our bathtub because it was so <laughs> tiny and really cute. Um, but they're just, they're really unique sharks. And if you have the chance to interact with them in the water, they're, they're docile and they don't, they're actually more scared of you than you are of them. And it's just, it, they're very large, but they're just very unique looking. Cool. So. I like hammerheads a lot. They're really neat animals. Yeah. <laughs> My favorite coral uh, would probably be, and Keisha can correct me on the, the name, <laughs> is a cropera that is that called a table coral. Mm, yeah, table yeah. coral. Mm -hmm. So we saw that also in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. And you don't really find them in the main Hawaiian Islands that often. And they were just, it was the most beautiful thing I could see because like a table, they don't really grow upwards. They grow out to the side. And so you could kind of estimate how old a coral was just based on its size. And it would just form this massive table and, and all these fish would kind of like live underneath of it because it provided shelter for them. And it was just very beautiful and came in different colors. And like I said, it was somewhere that I got to see something that most people don't. That's awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for sitting down with us today. This has been an awesome episode. We really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you for having yeah, us. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for listening to this episode of Conservation Connection. If you enjoyed our podcast, go ahead and subscribe to make sure you catch every episode that we post. We would love to hear from you. If you want to reach out to us, go to our website, lastchanceendeavors.com backslash contact and shoot us an email. If you're a teacher and you'd like to use this episode in your classroom, get in touch with us. We'll provide you with state and national standard tie-ins and additional materials to help you guide a class discussion. Thanks again for listening, and don't forget to tune in next week.